and welcome today to the JCU Library Sage Publishing Asia Pacific Grant for Indigenous HDR candidates. Uh, I'm Helen Hooper. I'm the Director of Library Services and the University Librarian. And I'd like to welcome a couple of people here that we've got in the audience, including Professor Jenny Seddon, Professor Ian Atkinson, uh, and online Professor Sana Nakata, Professor Sean Alm, Professor Rita, uh, Rosita Henry, and also Leon Todd from SAGE Regional Library Sales Manager. And note apologies that we have today from Professor Martin Nakata and Professor Marie Dinan Thompson, who could not be with us today. I'd also like to acknowledge um, with respect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first people, educators and innovators of this country. And today I'm on the lands of the Bindle people and their country, Thalgari Wagata. The Bindle people generously gifted the campus, Bebaguyamba, uh, meaning place of learning to in the Birigaba language during the 50th anniversary celebrations in 2020. They've been living on this land where this campus is situated for thousands of generations. The first people of Australia settled this country at least 65,000 years ago and the unique cultural and spiritual relationships to land and sea have remained to this day, despite many fracturing events. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to those of the neighbouring Wulgarugaba people. And I extend that respect to JCU's distinguished Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, graduates and staff. So a little bit about the SAGE grant and the SAGE Publishing Asia Pacific Grant for Indigenous HDR candidates uh, is was... Uh, negotiated with SAGE Publishing, which empowers researchers, educators and institutions to shape the future. As a global academic publisher of books, journals and a growing suite of library products and services, SAGE's mission is to build bridges to knowledge. To this end, SAGE Publications Asia Pacific are providing funds for a high degree research grant to Australian Indigenous HDR students at JCU. And this grant was first negotiated with SAGE by the library in 2020. And we had the first seminar in 2021, so where we brought together the winners of 2020 and 2021 in a time of COVID, so they were a bit of a smaller grouping. Um, and the winners for those years were Tamara Sam and Jesse King, both IERC HDR students with the 2022 seminar being presented by Georgia Storm, who was an IERC PhD candidate. Now, the topics included academic buoyancy amongst Indigenous secondary students, the Australian curriculum technologies and First Nation people, and exploring Indigenous cultural competence in legal practitioner client relations. And I have to say they were all fantastic seminars and I know today's will be as well. I'd like to acknowledge Sage and Rosalia Garcia, who's the Managing Director of Sage Publications Asia Pacific as sponsor. And I'd also like to highlight the work of our Manager Scholarly Communications, Jayshree Mantora, for her initiative in negotiating the initial annual $3,000 scholarship with Sage. And in fact, in 2022, we were able to secure additional funding to increase this to an, an annual $5,000 scholarship awarded to 2023, which has been really fantastic. Uh, Jay Shree's worked closely with me, the IERC and the GRS on this endeavour, including establishing the criteria and setting up the website and being part of the selection panel. And I'd also like to thank Prof, Prof. Nakata and the IERC once again for their enthusiasm and continued collaborations with library services in this area. So once again, we did have a very strong field of applications who met our selection criteria, and this included well thought out, clear and concise research, the importance of the project, its impact and reach and benefits to specific areas of the community and a few other things. So I would like to announce the 2023 winner, which is our Masters of Research candidate with the College of Public Health Medicine and Veterinary Sciences and C Senior Ethnobotanist with the Australian Tropical Herbarium, Gerald Turpin. Okay, before Jerry comes up, I presume Jerry's the preferred um, there, I'd like to give you a little bit about what his research is on. So Jerry's research is on the ethno 
botanical identification and biological activities of selected umbarabam medicinal plants. And apologies if my pronunciation isn't quite there. Uh, the research will document the ethnomedical knowledge of umbarabam Aboriginal community ethnographic techniques and archival information sources, identify five Aboriginal medicinal plants from Umbarambam, determine major classes of phytochemicals of crude extracts of five selected Umbarambam Aboriginal plants using natural products and techniques, and access the toxicity, antitoxant, and anti-inflammatory proper, uh, properties of selected plants, which honestly sounds quite fascinating, I have to say. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jerry to give us his presentation. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction and also thank JC Library and Sage for inviting me down um, today. Um, also thank you for turning up today and, all, and to those tuning in as well. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks for that. I also want to give an acknowledgement of the country. So, you know, acknowledge the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as traditional custodians of the land and waters where we live and work. Um, I pay my respects to the Vindal people and the elders past and present. I pay my respects to Indigenous people in the room and an online, and also the non-Indigenous peoples as well. Just a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, so it's a, a little bit of everything um, when you're talking about in biocultural knowledge, you know, that um, there's all these connections related to all different things. So, um, when I talk about plants, I'm not just, it's not just plants alone, but you, you're talking about, um, you know, the topics like the, the documentation, engagement, relationship building, um, and things like that. So that's uh, the holistic nature of biocultural knowledge. As is our custom, it's, um, it's who we are first before we talk about what we do. So um, Umbarabram, um, and you pronounce it right. <laughs> um, and the other name is Barbarum. So we're up there west of Herbron on the Atherton Tablelands. Um, also have uh, links to Wajanbare, Dingy and Nudgen on the Atherton Tablelands and also Kukutaipan on Cape York. Um, that country there, Savannah country, and um, there seems to be a lot of, um, or, or several, rare and threatened plants on there. And as you can see, we've got the purple wattle. They're the only purple wattle in the world. And other species like the gorillas as well. Um, this is where I work at the Australian Tropical Herbarium, a joint venture between um, state government, JCU and CSIRO. And housed um, within there is the Tropical Indigenous Ethnobotany Centre, which I manage. That was established around 2010 and together with traditional custodians from around Queensland and other parts of the country. Um, so they'll have an Indigenous working group and also a coordinating committee that helps me to manage that. And we work with many range of groups, um, traditional custodian groups and individuals um, um, around Queensland and other parts of the country. So this, my project is part of a, an overall project and it's a NHMRC funded project um, discovering novel anti-inflammatory drug lean molecules for the Imbarbarum Aboriginal medicinal plants. Um, it's a project team. It's um, a multi-institutional project with James Cook Uni, Macquarie University and the University of uh, Wollongong. So um, one of the main Persons is Fuka Wangchuk, my supervisor, and Roland Russia, um, Joe and Jamie from Macquarie, Stephen Pine from University of uh, Wollongong, Darren Crane from the Herbarium, and myself, and the Imbarbarum Aboriginal Corporation. And you can see there where the, um, the, the objectives, where the different universities, they, they're doing the different things within that um, project. 
Just following the, the drug discovery pathway. So that's um, the, our project is uh, the first to the early discovery and pre-clinical. Pre so that, that's where we're up at, to at the moment. Um, and we're targeting um, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So if, um, if you're not sure what inflammatory bowel disease is or IBD, uh, so it's a group of conditions um, that affects the stomach. Um, a couple of times, the Crohn's disease it affects both large and small intestines and ulcerative colitis that affects, affects the large intestines and colon. And you know, symptoms include diarrhea, the bomb, abdominal pain, weight loss and bleeding and fever. So, and that's pretty common now. Um, so IBD affects developed nations, including Australia. So, and notice that developed nations, um, and I, I guess it's because of all the um, refined foods and things like that. So um, they have 5,000 people in Australia diagnosed every year. So one in six suffers from IBD. And some people don't even know that they have IBD, yet they have all these problems. Uh, very costly, um, 3.7 billion. Uh, but the, the prevalence of IBD in Aboriginal populations are eight to 30 times lower than non-Aboriginal Australians. Herbal medicine is used widely. Um, but there's no data associated with um, complementary medicines so, um, and existing drugs are ineffective. So there's no cure for IBD. So that's where um, Indigenous knowledge could help. Um, the, the, I mentioned, you know, the low prevalence of IBD in Aboriginal people and we... The theory goes is that a lot of our food and medicine plants uh, have a lot of antioxidants and um, wound healing properties. So um, that's one of our theories, and and that's what we're aiming to find out. So, you know, if indigenous knowledge can help, um, there's been medicinal plant studies in um, the NT, New South Wales, South Australia, and Western Australia, but not much in North Queensland. So, um, you know, there's a few publications on medicinal plants, but there's been no research on it. So um, there's a large number of medicinal plants that are either unrecorded or they're not researched on. And so there's, a, you know, a huge potential um, in analysing um, plants in Queensland um, for yielding novel drugs, and, but also treating other diseases as well. So the uh, environment people, they have quite a, um, a bit of knowledge about medicinal plants and food plants, but a lot of that, um, a lot of our knowledge has been lost. So we've only got 300 words left in our language. So um, my main job in the project is to document from the elders and knowledge holders, but also there's other people as well um, due to the association with Aboriginal people in the area they do have knowledge. So it's all these bits and pieces, um, bringing them together um, like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, also do um, archival um, research as well. So looking at um, old botanical textbooks, explorer journals even, um, society journals and finding information out of there and then reinvigorating that back into the community. And that's... Um, uh, part of the ethnobotany scene as well. So finding that information and giving back to communities that I work with. And for this, the major project, um, they're using um, three Barbara medicinal plants. So the, um, the logical framework is the documentation, which I do. Um, it's part of the ethnobotany centre, so working with the mom. Benefits with that is I'm getting TOs out to all, particularly the young people, and um, they, they get paid for their time, and at the same time they're learning as well um, their own 
um, plant knowledge. Uh, I bring them back to the, um, the lab at the ATH um, for positive identification so that we know that we have the right um, plants. Um, immediate benefits, you know, could be the bush foods, um, the nutraceuticals, so things like herbal tea and that, which could benefit financially, you know, with um, tourism ventures and things like that. And then, but back in the lab is where, um, you know, you, you go through the, the uh, analysing of the plants. Um, so they, they look, they've looked at isolation of the novel molecules and um, they found several new ones. And, and the new ones um, can be named by the community, um, whatever. So it could be after an elder or whatever. So, um, so they have the, the benefit of naming those new molecules. Um, there's rat testing involved um, and the drug lead identification, which leads to the novel drugs, and then the benefits for everybody. So for the, the biodiscovery pathways um, with the Embarban community, so working out um, the agreements and consent forms, we have to go through that, um, follow the, the guides, guidelines of the Biodiscovery Act, and that's between JCU and the Embarban community. Um, with the multi-institutional agreements as well, all the agreements, and then um, the, the state government. So... Um, we had to go through the biodiscovery plan and approval, which took about a month, uh, collection authority uh, for the plans, and then a benefit sharing agreement with, um, with the state government. Um, yeah, so through JCU, um, we, we did the collection of plans, and then that's where we do an isolation testing compounds, um, JCU community meeting to share the, the data or agree on BSA and um, intellectual property, which is important. Um, for those that don't know what the biodiscovery is, it's, um, it's just the um, collection and analysis of native biological materials, say plants, animals, and other organisms for commercial applications uh, with a pharmaceutical and for pharmaceuticals and intersexoids. Uh, and the purpose of the Biodiscovery Act is to ensure that biodiscovery activities in Queensland are sustainable while returning a fair and equitable benefits to the community. It also allows for compliance with the legal requirements for Queensland and helps demonstrate alignment with the um, international law, such as um, Nagoya Protocol and I, um, IBD and UNDRIP even. Um, so when using First Nation knowledge, it ensures that it is only used under an agreement with um, traditional custodians. So in research on the biological materials, you have to um, find out who the right people for the, on the right country and have written agreements and consent. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, all the different aspects and it's a bit hard to summarise into 20, 30 minutes. So I uh, apologise if I'm sort of, um, it's not that much detailed. Um, so the engagement process is one of the most important aspects of um, research. So um, it's where, you know, Professor Nakara, he calls it the cultural interface. And it's a space where the two experts meet. Um, and lay everything out on the table. Um, so, yeah, it's just an understanding of um, what is required. Um, what do the TOs want out of it? What do the researchers want out of it? And coming to an agreement and um, the project doesn't move forward un unless everything is all understood and explained and then, then the, the agreements are signed. Um, Part of that is um, researchers coming out on country, so reciprocal visits, researchers coming out on country, just meeting. Um, you know, they can even camp, sit around the campfire and drink tea and 
um, making the AMPM. They're all part of the engagement process. Um, but also our mob went, uh, they went down to um, Sydney and to the ATH or the Australian Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine and had a look in the labs there. So they get an understanding. A lot of average people don't really understand um, what happens to their plants when it's taken off country. So it gives them an understanding as well. But also the researchers who come and onto country and just slow down, you know. Um, so, you know, understand and value both knowledge systems uh, needs a cultural broker. So I act in that position um, quite a lot. Not sure what's happened there. That's where I was up to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so this, my, this is my master project as part of the overall. So just looking at the ethnobotany and biological activities of Barbara Municipal Plants and my aims or the aims for that project was to do a lit review, um, that document the knowledge, as I've been saying. Um, so I've identified five Barbara Medicinal Plants um, and then in the lab um, been determining the major class of phytochemicals you know, from crude extracts. Um, and then assess the toxicity, antioxidants, and anti-inflammatory properties, which um, we still yet to do. So that's a lit review that I've published. Um, if you, I won't go through, but if you're interested in having a read, um, there's a, a link there. Um, document and knowledge. So this is where our elders came down to visit the lab. Um, and also they, they had a look in the, the herbarium as well to look at plants and the, the knowledge that is recorded, it, it's put into a database and I use it, the Miramar database. And it's, it's a little program that's designed by an Aboriginal person from New South Wales and in it you can put in your um, language, upload photos and uh, videos, audio recordings and other information as, um, as required. Uh, it's a good teaching tool too for kids in learning how to uh, record knowledge and, um, you know, but they're all up with this kind of technology anyway. <laughs> so these are the plants that I've chosen, and I'll just let that species names. Um, but um, the, the hop bush, uh, pea, uh, coleus, or plectranthus. Um, the bush um, native cherry and one of the um, Morania species. So just the process of myself in the field up the top is um, collecting plants and just um, chopping them up into manageable um, pieces. Uh, sometimes we have to take the dryer out into the field. Um, if it's wet and it's just a gas bottle and a burner underneath and then we just sit the, the plants on, on a tray on top. Um, they bring it back to the lab, um, crush it up into powder and then we add um, ethanol. One part is ethanol and then the, the other one is water as well. So using the um, original methods uh, but there was cold water, but sometimes we use boiling water as well, or water is heated up. Um, and that's process repeated three times, and then add it in to get the ones filtered with the crude extract. Um, the, the results, so uh, we quite these results just going through the lab techniques and methods. Um, so as you can see, you know. Gallic as it is used as the standard compound. Um, you can see the red line up top. That's a, a, the standard that you, you compare the um, other um, extracts to. And you, you, I don't know if you can actually see it, but the exocarpus leaves. So exocarpus, cajanus, and coleus um, were the best three species to scavenge the, um, the DPP radicals. Um, phenolic content and flavonoid contents. 
um, exocarpus again at the um, highest total of phenolics. You can see by the, the graph over there, um, followed by cajanus and exocarpus, um, all in ethanol, uh, except for the exocarpus stem, um, which has a water extract. Um, that's for the phenolic content and then the flavonoids where yeah, the eucalyptus leaves extract, exocarpus leaves, sorry, had um, the highest total flavonoids followed by cajanus and exocarpus bark extract. So the, the overall result is that exocarpus, cajanus and coleus um, showed the best antioxidant activity, um, but then toxicity and anti-inflammatory activities, um, as I mentioned, will be um, done uh, soon. Um, so just acknowledge the Embargo Aboriginal Corporation um, just for their, you know, leadership and guidance and um, their willingness to work with us. Um, supervisors, Super One Chat, Darren Crane and Roland Russia. Um, the JCA admin team as well, but special mentions to um, Dr. Karma. He's um, provided advice in the lab and guided me there. Um, I haven't got a biomedical background, so steep learning curve. And uh, so he had the patience to um, teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> um, just acknowledging the financial um, resources, the NHMRC funding, um, the Institute of Tropical Health and Medicine, also, there's the Farm of Queensland Hospital Foundation grant and, and obviously um, the JCU Library Sage Publishing Grant for Indigenous ACR students. Um, sorry, there was a bit rust, but just trying to cram that into one small session. And thank you for that. I'll just get Jerry to stay here and see if there's any questions at all. Do you know, Claire, if you've got any online first or, or not at the moment? Is there any questions in the room? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. That was very, very informative. My question was, how have, how have you decided after your Richard to review which were the five selected plants? Because I will imagine that you found a lot of different plants that could have potential, but how about the decision to say, I will select these five? Uh, so we look for plants that had um, that we use culturally for um, wound healing and you know th things like that. So they so they obviously had antioxidants in them. So that's why we selected those that potentially had the antioxidants and wound healing properties in the plants. Thank you so much. That's the last presentation. Thank you. Um, just a quick question on um, the distribution of these plants. Are they unique to this part of the world or are they in other parts of Australia? Um, so we tried to get plants that were unique to the the area of our mob, but that's something they do. Um, sometimes plants are found um, all over Queensland sometimes, but um, yeah, we, we tried to keep the plants um, um, and use the, the plants where they were located, so more endemically as well. Um, so I missed the beginning, but did you have expectations for each of those five plant species would have come out the highest in their antioxidant properties? Um, did you expect that exocarpus might come out? As yeah, no, we had no. <laughs> um, yeah, so well, uh, we just selected a, a lot of the ones that had the, you know, the what we thought had the antioxidant properties, yeah, so we had didn't have any idea of what would uh, come out as the highest, yeah. Um, but it just happened that the ones we selected um, did, so. And also they were the easiest to collect and easily found yeah. as well. So were they all common species? Yeah, common species. 
question, Jerry. Thank you um, for that presentation. You said it sounds superficial, but to, I think to many of us that was actually really in depth for those not in the in the botanical field. I was just wondering, what do you see as the potential outcomes for the outcomes for community and for migrant people as part of this research project? Um, so, as was mentioned, there's the immediate benefits. So with the, the young people coming out of one country and relearning their um, cultural knowledge. Um, also, you know, the Western science, a bit of Western science as well, and the financial benefits that could come from natural medicines, so things that they could do, soap making, um, nutritionals, and things like that. But the, the other benefits is the, the pharmaceutical side as well, which... Um, which really happens anyway, I think, because of the, the cost involved. But, um, you know, if the, the potential is good, the, there is good potential there. So that's what we're pursuing at the moment, um, doing those extra um, analysing of those plants. So just pointing out the, the, what the, the, the novel um, molecules, you know, and how they work. Um, and whether they'd be, uh, you know, potentially great for IBD. But everything, um, every step of the way requires agreements and, you know, signing of contracts. So it's not just a one-off contract. It's every step of the way to make sure that Indigenous people are, you know, they're kept in it, up, up with it all and, um, and to ensure that they do get benefits. And Jerry, did you start sampling across a number of seasons during the year? How do you expect the chemicals, uh, the compounds to vary in the concentration? Yeah, so that, that would be another um, side study is whether, you know, that because um, certain plants you do have to collect at different times. So, you know, that the connection that I spoke about earlier, um, where everything's connected, sometimes you have to wait until certain, certain things happen with one plant, say the flowering of a shrub or something, it tells you that another initial plant or a food plant is ready in another part of the country. So, yeah, that requires a different study. I'm wondering if there were any connections with um, traditional stories or information about when you would gather a certain type of plant. Yeah. Whether or not that lines up with some of the chemistry that you would find in the lab. Yeah, so that's part of the, the documenting is finding out what the, the background story is as well. Um, mm -hmm. Mine's not so much of a question, but I just want to say thank you very much. As someone who went through a year of cancer treatment in 2019, mm -hmm. my family sent me large gummy that sent me sugar bag. And I had, well, I appreciate the sentiment. I took my chemo instead because <laughs> some of the research that I found in one of the chemos that I did, it was actually discovered in the bark of the yew tree in North America. So what you're doing here in Australia is great and needed that cultural interface, that cross-knowledge for finding local treatments for our future is really, really good. And to have that indigenous knowledge because I took, I didn't really take my family stuff because I didn't want them to think they had cured me. <laughs> I didn't want to give you know anyone the excuse to not go to a doctor and actually get treatment. So what I think what your project is the future, it's amazing. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I think you know sometimes we have to use common sense as well. So, um, a lot of people selling products now and promote them as, you know, cancer healing and all sorts of things. So, um, but yeah, you know, sometimes it's just to promote their product for financial gain. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, we've got any more questions? No? I suppose mine was similar to what someone else said in that, like, if you're looking to get to that pharmaceutical stage, how long a process do you think that is? Is this a five-year, 10-year, 20-year type process that you um, think? Yeah, so the first thing is to find out if it does have, yeah. and it's got to be very yeah. good. Um, 
and then finding out who you can um, who can will finance it. Yeah. You know, yeah. millions of dollars. Yeah. For, and they need to be sure that there will be an outcome, I think, if they're going to provide millions of dollars. So um, uh, I'm not sure if you could fast track anything. Mm. But yeah, it could be from 10 years or upwards. So I don't think there's any online questions. There are a lot of uh, congratulations. Congratulations chats. questions in my uh, chat. Um, but yeah, lots, lots of people are congratulating you, Mary on the names of your. Yeah, and we've got about 20 people online, I think. So that's 23. 23, even yeah. better, um, which is great. But what I'd like to do now, just to keep us on time, is um, hand over to Dr. Aileen McDowell, who's HDR coordinator, IERC, um, and also Associate Professor Sana Nakada, who's Principal Research Fellow, IERC, for a few words. I'll just shut this, Jerry, that's okay. Right. Um, thank you, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak quickly. I have not brought a whole tome, just a <laughs> few notes that I was reflecting on as you were speaking, Jerry. This is the fourth year we've had a SAGE scholarship. Um, I want to start by thanking Jay Shree and, and the SAGE team as well for everything you've done to make this possible. It's a really big opportunity for our HDR students here to be able to, to apply for this grant, and that money goes to help fund their research but also their, their ability to pay their bills so that they can keep working on their research project. I'm, um, so my name is Dr. Ailey McDowell. I'm a non-Indigenous person. I'm one of the researchers, um, lecturers, all around people here at the centre. And I was given the opportunity to get to work with our HDR students when I started in my first year in 2019 and quite fresh out of my own PhD myself, I must say. Um, and in the last five years, I've got to work with any number of Indigenous PhD students and MPhil students, not just at the IERC, but across the university. Um, I get to drink cups of coffee with them and do writing groups with them and read theory with them. Um, and then going to a show with someone tonight too. Um, so I've been able to form a lot of really great relationships. And what I've seen at every point of the way is the absolute persistence and commitment that our HDR students have to their work because anybody who's done a PhD or an MPhil here, and I know there's a couple of people, knows that it, it's a hard job. It's not really fun most of the time, but there's a reason why we do it. And that is hardest yet again, I think, when you are trying to work in the intersection of Indigenous and Western knowledges. We have somewhere between, on any given day, 25 and 30 Indigenous HDR students at the university. We have probably another 40 to 50 non-Indigenous students who are also working with Indigenous research topics. Last year, we set up an Indigenous research support network and we've got at least 100 people who are registered with us to come to our monthly meetings. So we, we have, we're starting to really build a community around this and the type of work that students do is, I would argue, qualitatively different to a lot of other students doing their HDR studies. And I'm, I'm actually working on a research project at the moment. And one of the students and it said to me, she goes, I'm not just counting barnacles, you know? And um, that idea that it's not just sitting there trying to, to count up the barnacles, but rather we're asking our students to work with community, to work with Indigenous knowledge within a Western system. And that's just really one I would like to impress on people from what Jerry's presented today that you made it look very smooth and very easy, but I know that it's not. I know that you're working with two knowledge systems that have fundamentally different philosophical bases that you're trying to bring together and work in a really cooperative way. Um, and we saw it in the pictures, right? We saw pictures of you looking through the microscope and pictures of you working with traditional owners. And that skill basis is one thing, but also the conceptual basis to be able to do that work. And this is also a task which is really unfamiliar to a lot of our supervisors. That's the other thing that I wanted to just impress here is that the university is still working out how we can support HDR students to be doing this work. Um, this is all really important because JCU takes very seriously its commitment to the communities that we live in and particularly to Indigenous communities here in, in the North and in Northern Australia. And it's researchers like Jerry and, and our other HDR students who are able to help 
do both of those jobs of supporting the goals and aspirations of Indigenous communities at the same time as driving the research efforts um, of the university, of, of the pharmaceutical companies. Hopefully one day you're able to, to scale this up um, and to be able to bring those two knowledge systems together. Um, so thank you, Jayshree and the library, not just for the scholarship, but for all the sessions that you have with our HDR students. I know we get them in here to talk to our MPhils. Sam and Yanti sit in the centre a couple of days a week and their time's not just spent with undergraduate students. I, I spotted at least one HDR sitting with them the other day. Um, so the support the library provides is absolutely vital, as is the support of the GRS and, and the broader division of research. So um, thank you. It's four years of SAGE now, hopefully many more to come. I think this is a real highlight every year, having getting to have these seminars as well and hear the different work. I'm glad a non-IERC student won it too. <laughs> so we'll be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will now hand over to my wonderful colleague, Associate Professor Sana Nakata, who's a Senior Principal Research Fellow here at IERC and is on Zoom. Thank you um, very much for that. Dr. Ailey, an enormous congratulations to you, Dr. Jerry. We are so thrilled and we're so proud and we're so deeply impressed with the work and its contribution to science and to the healthcare of, um, of, of all people, not just in our own communities. I want to, on behalf of the Indigenous Education and Research Centre, offer my apologies on behalf of the DVC, Indigenous Education and Strategy, Professor Martin Nakata, who unfortunately is unwell with COVID and unable to be with you on campus at Bebagu Yumba today. An enormous thank you to Sage Publishing for their continued support of this prize and our deepest thanks to Jay Shree at the Marvo Library who works so closely with us in the IERC and with other librarians and support staff. It is, it takes a team, it takes a community um, to undertake a PhD project and it's really marvellous to see all of these connections and contributions come together in the room today. Listening to your presentation, Dr Jerry, four things stood out for me, which I would just like to take a few minutes to reflect on about the broader context and contribution and significance of the type of work that you've done and that you'll continue to do in your career. I think that this is this project is a really potent reminder that Indigenous knowledges offer new reference points for Western science and that without these new reference points provided by traditional Indigenous knowledge holders and our ongoing and contemporary understanding as Indigenous peoples of of the resources available to us, of our connection to country, our understanding of the ecosystems we live in, that we that these, these are the conditions of what innovation is going to require in the Western sciences in the decades and centuries ahead. And as I've already mentioned, I think that such innovations and contributions at the interface of Indigenous knowledges and Western knowledge is something that results in better outcomes for all human people on, on, this, on this continent and in this world. Um, we talk a lot in Indigenous research about research impact that benefits our communities, but this is a beautiful example of how our research contribution can benefit all. I'd say also that I think this is a reminder that this type of knowledge production that you've been engaged in, Dr. Jerry, can help not just to position you and our other Indigenous research graduates well for their own careers and for directing their own research agendas in line with their own interests, but that it creates the very capacity that our wider communities need to realise self-determination. When we have this type of extraordinary knowledge 
training, skill, expertise sitting in our own communities who can capably navigate this interface between Indigenous and Western knowledges. We begin to create the conditions for passing that knowledge and skill onto next generations, growing the numbers of us in our communities who know how to do this work and over time can put ourselves in positions where we can set and lead the agenda alongside non-Indigenous researchers to build genuine and true self-determination capability in our communities. The last thing I wanted to say was actually, and I, I we couldn't help ourselves, Dr. Jerry, Dr. Ailey and I were sort of messaging effusive um, compliments about your research while you were presenting. But I have to say that there is a beautiful circularity here in research informed teaching. Because I, as I listen to you describe your research, your understanding of the problem, the types of partnership work and research protocols that had to be navigated, I thought this was a wonderful example that brings to life and will bring to life in our classrooms, I hope, for students what we mean when we talk about cultural interface and cultural interface theory. And I see a really immediate and positive impact that's available now within our own programs to utilise your PhD research, to cite your work, and to start feeding that into our very own students at JCU, not just in the sciences, but also in the programs that we teach in Indigenous studies. So across the board, in all dimensions of scholarly and intellectual life, um, with immense gratitude to you for your contribution to your community and of, you know, doing a, an extraordinarily capable job of highlighting the value of Indigenous knowledges to the world. I congratulate you on the SAGE Publishing Award for the Asia Pacific and um, from those of us in the IERC, thank you. Hey, well, I think that's most of the formalities over. So it just comes to me to wrap up. And honestly, I'm not sure I can say anything more after Ailey and Santa have because they've covered everything. But, um, you know, that cultural medical interface of Indigenous and Western knowledge, I think, is, is that key. And I know when Jay Shri and I and the other people on the panel were looking at all of the applications, this just looks so fascinating um, in, in, in what it could do. So, and um, I, so I really hope um that there is progress made in this area and my word for the day is new nutraceuticals is that what it was nutraceuticals i was like i hadn't heard that before but i quite like it <laughs> that will be my word for the day so now um comes to me to thank jerry very much for making the trip here to townsville and for putting this presentation together and um to give him a, a little a, a piece of paper and a little trophy and um <laughs> and hope that the money is in Jerry's account. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I, I will say that for those here, we have a little morning tea. And unfortunately, for those online, you'll have to have your own morning tea. Sorry that you're not here with us.